Good evening, everyone. Uh, as a preliminary matter, I'm Diane M. Mahan, Select Board Chair. Permit me to confirm that all members and persons anticipated on the agenda are present and can hear me. Members, when I call your name, please respond in the affirmative. Dan Dunn? Here. Joe Kiro? Here. John Hurd? Here. Steve DeCourcy? Here. Town staff, when I call your name, also please respond in the affirmative. Our town manager, Adam Chapdelaine. Here. Our town council, Doug Hine. Here. And Ashley Marr from the select board office is um, taking minutes remotely. Good evening. This is an open meeting of the Arlington Select Board being conducted remotely consistent with Governor Baker's executive order of March 12, 2020, due to the current state of emergency in the Commonwealth. In order to mitigate the transmission of the virus and reduce risk of COVID-19 illness, we have been advised and directed by the Commonwealth to suspend public gatherings and as such, the governor's order suspends the requirement of the open meeting law to have all meetings in a publicly accessible physical location. Further, all members of public bodies are allowed and encouraged to participate remotely. The order which you can find posted with agenda materials for this meeting allows public bodies to meet entirely remotely so long as reasonable public access is afforded so that the public can follow along with the deliberations of the meeting. Ensuring public access does not require ensuring public participation unless there is a public hearing on the agenda. This meeting will feature some public comment during certain agenda items, including the election update and polling location discussion. It will not feature citizens open forum consistent with the board's practice when warrant article hearings are on the agenda. To my understanding, some members of the public would like to provide some comment on the election process. So after members of the board have spoken, I as the chair will ask for a list of persons, persons wishing to provide comment and call on each in turn. Please keep in mind that all participants and members of the public must be recognized by the chair before speaking. For this meeting, the select board is convening by Zoom is posted on the town's website, identifying how the public may join in. Please note that this meeting is being recorded and that some attendees are participating by video conference. Accordingly, please be aware that anything broadcasted may be captured by the recording. Please also take care to adjust your screen or device name if you would like to speak. In order for us to recognize speakers appropriately and develop accurate minutes, it is helpful for participants to see your full first and last name when calling upon you rather than a nickname. Finally, all participants are advised that people may be listening who do not provide comment and those persons are not required to identify themselves. All of the materials for this meeting are available on the Novus Agenda dashboard and the board's webpage. We recommend the members and public follow the agenda as posted on Novus, unless I note otherwise. Now, before we turn to the first item on the agenda, uh, permit me to cover some ground rules for effective and clear conduct of our business and to ensure accurate me meeting minutes. I will introduce each speaker on the agenda. After they conclude their remarks, the chair will go down the line of select board members, inviting each by name to provide any comment, questions, or motions. Please hold until your name is called. And further, please remember to mute your phone or computer when you are not speaking. Please remember to speak clearly in a way that helps generate accurate minutes. For any response, please wait until the chair yields the floor to you. And each vote taken in this meeting will be conducted by a roll call vote. I would like to ask our town manager, Mr. Chapdelaine, to also make one additional comment about the manner in which we'll be conducting the meeting tonight. Mr. Chapdelaine. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I just wanted to mention for those uh, participating tonight that we will be trying something different than the past, I believe, two board meetings. Um, this is, I think, the third meeting that we've been using the webinar format, uh, which had uh, been presenting with a limiting factor of uh, not allowing participants video to be shown when speaking. Uh, that was also being performed or, or that was also went, went in line with uh, security security mitigation that we'd put in place after the Conservation Commission had been Zoom bombed several weeks ago with some very explicit and disturbing imagery being demonstrated on the screen. So tonight what we're going to try to do is promote those in attendance who want to speak to panelists, uh, the panelist position temporarily so they can show their videos if they so choose. 
Um, but I, I do want to mention that we, we do so understanding that we are, we're shifting the balance slightly towards a heightened risk, where, where is that, uh, or we're in that, if someone whose name we know wants to speak, the chair shall call on them. If someone's name we don't know wants to speak, the chair shall call on them, and we can't predict what might come up on the screen. So um, I'm not saying that this is an unacceptable risk, but uh, a, a risk that we should understand before doing it. Second, as a matter of equity, um, I know there's, there's equity concerns on both sides of this coin, but I think it's important to mention that for those who are calling in or who don't have the technology at home to utilize video, uh, they won't have that same access to show themselves on video as those participating do. So uh, with that though, I didn't want anybody to be surprised that when called upon tonight, uh, we will promote them to panelists and if they so choose, their video will be enabled. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Chapdelaine. And as we said, we're just gonna, every week's different <laughs> and we're gonna keep trying to make accommodations and see what works and what doesn't work. Um, um, I apologize in advance for, um, but um, you don't know unless you try. So we're gonna try. And um, my colleagues um, are also all in agreement with that. Um, uh, so with that, we will go to agenda item two, which is the third quarter report for 2020. Uh, uh, Mr. Chapdelaine. So uh, thank you, Madam Chair. What I'll do is I will uh, we'll, we'll test this for the first time. Uh, should be a safe test. We'll ask Sandy Pooler to come and address the board in regards to this third quarter report. Our deputy town manager, Mr. Deputy Pooler. Town manager. Thank you. Yeah, we're... Ta -da. Somehow I just got it posted. So there you go. So, well, there he is. Hello, Sandy. Should I also bring Ida uh, in as a panelist for this as well? Yes, please. Okay. Nice beard, Sandy. Oh my God, I forgot to shave. <laughs> wow, thanks. Um, she should be coming in here, let's see. I think we just, we just lost Ida. Oh. Ida, do we have you? Here she is. All there right. she is. Okay, so our comptroller, Ida Cody, is yes. also joining us. Um, our deputy town manager, Mr. Poor. Yes, hello. Um, so I will uh, cut to the chase right from the beginning and say that this report, which is through three quarters of the year uh, through March, at that point showed um, that we are basically on track for both our spending and our revenue, which both of which is good news. Um, I'll also say that Ida and I have looked at our revenue and spending through April, um, even though all those numbers are not uh, fully in at this point, most of them are, and they continue to be on track. Uh, the reality is that 77% of our revenue comes from, uh, in the general fund comes from taxes. And those tax collections have been coming in steadily. The other revenue that we've gotten so far, uh, including local receipts, have also come in steadily through April. We've actually hit our budget target. Uh, through March, we were just a little bit short of that. And um, state aid uh, has been coming in steadily uh, unless there's a disruption to that by the end of the year, which the state so far has said they're not planning to disrupt distributions of state aid in FY20, we expect that that will come in as originally projected. So overall, I think, uh, at least for FY20, we're in good shape. Uh, we have been talking to departments about their spending and trying to get them to clear up um, their encumbrances, their old purchase orders and so forth and get them off the books because if they're not really going to need to uh, buy things by the end of this year, we're asking them to, to clear those off the books. Um, that in the overall sense is the general fund. They, we have five enterprise funds, the water and sewer fund, uh, and then uh, the enterprise funds for Breck and Rink, uh, as well as for um, the Council on Aging Transportation Fund, and um, our, uh, excuse me, our fund for uh, 
counseling youth known as the AYCC fund. Uh, those funds, most of them are doing well. Um, there is a lag, uh, we think, in revenue collection in water and sewer, uh, but we also are looking very much at trying to keep down our spending there. Uh, AYCC funding, uh, they have expended more, they've expended 86% of their budget at this point of the year, um, but they're also collecting more revenue than um, they uh, had originally been budgeted. And so Ida and I both think that the AYCC fund will be in good shape. Council on Aging Transportation has only expended 53% of its budget, mostly due to some vacancies there. Um, they've collected 75% of their revenue, and so we think that is in good shape. The one fund that really worries us is the uh, Ed Burns Rent Fund. Uh, we think that there is a good chance that there will be a, um, a deficit in that fund. To deal with that so far, we have um, laid off the part-time workers who work keeping up the rink. The rink has been shut down since March, both for mechanical issues and because um, we just couldn't operate it because of the quarantine uh, restrictions. Um, the temporary department head, Bobby Jefferson, who's been working with Ida and with uh, Julie Wayman in my office to look at their expenditures and try to keep them down um, and and cancel out any, um, any purchase orders. Having said that, we do think that there is still a, uh, a risk that there will be a deficit in that fund. It does not have much of a substantial fund balance. So uh, there may be the need to supplement that with um, either supplement it with general fund funds at the end of the year going through the finance committee uh, or um, not transfer some things out of that fund that we usually transfer like health insurance office. So we're monitoring that closely and we'll come to decisions before the end of the year. And then finally, the recreation fund um, has also seen a drop off in its revenue, uh, a drop off in uh, some of its expenses too. There is a fairly substantial fund balance in that enterprise fund. So if the revenue does not meet uh, expenses for the year, and they end up with a deficit, that deficit can be covered by um, the fund balance in the recreation fund. Uh, so having said that, I, can, I would go back uh, to the memo. Uh, there's a lot of detail in here about specific, a lot of specific departments and their spending. Um, much of the explanation of that is consistent with what you've seen in previous reports. Um, so I don't think there are any real major changes. Um, and so at this point, I think instead of going through it in a lot of detail, I would just stop at this point and ask if any members or have any questions or if Ida wants to make any other comments. And it, defer to you here. Yes, if I could call on our comptroller, Ms. Cody. Yes, can you hear me? Yes. Hello, everyone. Hello. Hi. Ida, is there anything you want to add to what I said? I think you've pretty much covered everything accurately. Yeah. Well, that's, that's a bonus. That's great. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. OK, um, with that, um, unless our town manager indicates elsewise, I'm going to call on Mr. Dunn. Uh, Thank you. Uh, you answered most of the questions I had. Um, does your dirty crystal ball say anything about 2021? Right now, uh, we are doing a lot of forecasts and what ifs about 2021. Uh, the biggest question uh, is what's going to happen with state aid. Uh, we are having a meeting uh, with the revenue working group this week uh, to speak uh, with them in preparation for then calling a long range planning committee meeting to inform members of that committee of what our findings are. Uh, we don't really have any inside information about what the state is gonna do. They've been very tight-lipped about it. So that is a big question. 
Um, the other question is about local receipts. Um, I think that local receipts that are most in danger of falling short are our hotel motel taxes and our meals tax. Because we expect there will be a continued period into FY21 when those things do not come in at their projections. Um, so what to do about that for next year is part of the conversation that we're going to have uh, among ourselves this week and then more publicly after that. Um, I will say I think uh, at this point the the biggest question for us is not really what's going to happen in FY21. The biggest question is going to be how this will affect the next time we need an override. Um, and right now our projections are with the numbers that were in the governor's budget, FY24 would be the budget year when we would need to have an override by. Some of the projections that I've looked at internally move that up to FY23. Um, and a position that I, I personally think is unacceptable. I think what we're going to try to do is work to make sure we don't have to have an override earlier than FY24. But a lot of that depends on things that we don't know yet. So that's where we are. I hope that answers the question. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Kiro. Um, thank you very much. And thank you for all of this, this information. It, it has been so helpful since we've been getting these quarterly um, reports to just have a have a feel for where, where our fiscal position is. I just have one one question and it's on the um, snow and ice, which you know we had a very light winter, but we're showing 117.2% um, used. Um, is that because we typically just make that up on the back end? And uh... so I think that has to do with probably there are some encumbrances in there for buying things like salt that um, we haven't we didn't clear out as of um, the end of March. So um, I think that is probably a significant part of that number and we'll see it um, align more closely to what we actually are gonna need by the end of the year. So th through the chair. So if, if we do have some of that stockpiled, then presumably that'll be advantageous to next year. That's also true. Okay, great, thank you. Mr. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you for all the information. That was very helpful. Um, just one comment about the Ed Burns Fund. Once we get to the end of this fiscal year and we can resolve that enterprise fund, just it'd be a good time. You know, we all that use the rink hope come September it will be open and ready to go. But just to make sure we're planning and preparing for in the event, that's one fund that if this continues, will continue to not generate its revenue. So. I just think it's something that we need to look forward to and keep in mind as we're going through the numbers here. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. And Mr. DeCourcy. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, thank you, Mr. Pooler and Ms. Cody for the, uh, the quarterly reports. I, they have been very helpful. And the question just for fiscal 21, um, one of the provisions in, in chapter 53 is, is that the town could adopt a 112th budget if we're unable to adopt the budget for fiscal 21. And so much of the work you're doing hinges on having an idea of what state aid will be in, in fiscal 21. Um, if, if you're not getting um, they call it guidance or an idea of, of, of what to use, is there a, a possibility that there could be a recommendation to go 112th until we get a little bit more certainty or, or would you prefer to to pass a budget and, and perhaps adjust during the year? Um, Adam and I have not talked about the exact timing of that, my, but I would say, it is my opinion, that uh, the extent that we are able to have a town meeting and pass a budget, that we would do that. If by the time that comes up, we don't have any information from the state about state aid, um, at that point, I think it might be, uh, at that, that point, I would maybe recommend going with the 112 budget. 112 budget means that uh, we have to go forward each month with a budget that is at least 112th of the FY20 budget and can be more. There are some things that we tend to pay, for example, at the beginning of the year, such as our pension allocation, uh, that I would recommend that we go forward and just pay into the pension fund right up front. 
keeps us on track for pension funding and so forth. There are other things in the budget that we have adjusted and added, made recommendations for additions this year. Some of those I think I would hold back on before if we didn't know enough about our state aid. That's all very general and will depend on what our state aid numbers are. We have been talking within the finance group with Ida, uh, with uh, Mike Mason from the school department, with Phyllis, with Paul Tierney uh, and other staff about what a 112 budget would look like. So we will be prepared to put that forward if necessary. Um, I think, again, my preference would be to try to see if there, it is possible to have a town meeting and go forward with a regular budget at that point. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chapterling? Just, just to uh, really second Sandy's remarks, um, I, I would certainly prefer if, if it's possible and responsible to adopt uh, a full year's budget with the potential for coming back in the fall to make adjustments. Um, if there's more information that we're still waiting for, so let's say the state's budget does not come out before July 1st, um, but we anticipate it coming out over the summer in September, we could adopt a budget with reasonable estimates and then clean it up in the fall. Alternatively, really our approach wouldn't be entirely dissimilar if we adopted the 112 budget, we would do it in the manner in which Sandy describes, but likely come back in the fall also to adopt a full year budget. So um, I, th I think these are discussions we'll all be having over the next couple of weeks uh, leading into June, leading up to town meeting and determining what the, you know, what, what's the best risk balance for the community given what we will know at the time. Thank you. Um, I have, I think two questions, well, one request. Um, and I, I love all the detail that's in here and, and you continue to add to it and, and expand it and customize it. Um, I was wondering if in the future we could, um, on top of the Munis report, maybe have sort of like a table of contents of where, um, like one of the things and one of the questions I would ask you is I wanted to look up, it seems as though everybody is building everywhere. <laughs> if I watch on Facebook and I'm just, I was trying to find in here where I would go in terms of whether it's building department inspectional services. And it's because of the way it comes out on my iPad, it's almost impossible to zoom it enough and I did have the office printed out so I wasn't able to find that so if there's any way just for the 15 or 18 categories if you could just have like a cover sheet on the front that says you know on what page in the whatever amount of pages it says it usually says but anyways if that's possible and then my my second question would be is it just me I would go to look to see if what I'm thinking is that a lot of people seem to be building and, and renovating, um, which means they're probably pulling building permits. Um, what what can you glean out of Munis, Munis or is it everything's projected the way we thought? So that's a very good question. Um, and it's been very interesting to see that, in fact, you're exactly right. People are pulling building, building permits. Uh, the inspections office has been open uh, they have a little basket out front where people can drop things. So they're not allowing people to come into the building, but they have been able to process paperwork and a, quite a few people have taken out permits and that revenue, it may be, it's, it's consistent with what it's been over the last few years. So I would say we have not been significantly hurt in any way from a lack of building permits. Uh, that construction work does continue. Okay, no, okay. So whatever um, for the next quarter report, um, um, in, 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 you don't necessarily have to um, do anything voluminous, but even if you call and say, you know, you might want to look on page 27 of Munis, because uh, I just want to see how that trends, if that's just sort of an initial thing, um, if that's going to continue to rise. And I only bring that up to the point when we get to whether it's the Ed Burns Arena or some other area in town or uh, decisions around furloughs and layoffs in the future, um, if that is something that continues to trend up, as I would say, um, that's a good thing for us to know because there's a lot of other things that unfortunately are, tr are trending down. 
So um, I can't see the right hand side of my screen. I can't, I'm texting my husband. Somehow this calendar says, start your calendar and I don't know how to sh shut it down. So if anyone, if any one of my colleagues or the town manager sees that someone, especially my board colleagues are raising their hand, let me know. And if not, I don't think we need a motion for this, do we? Oh, no. To move receipt. Let's move receipt by Mr. Carroll. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Mr. DeCourcy. Any further questions or comments? Uh, if not, on a motion by Mr. Carroll, seconded by Mr. DeCourcy. Attorney Heim, roll call, please. Mr. DeCourcy? Yes. Mr. Hurd? Yes. Mr. Kiro? Yes. Mr. Dunn? Yes. Ms. Mahan? Yes. That's 5 0 unanimous vote. And I want to thank um, Ms. Cody and Mr. Pooler for once again really getting the gist and then some of um, what the board continues to request and expand upon. Um, and you do it so seamlessly, but I know it's not. So, um, you know, thank you both for all of your hard work and efforts. It's appreciated. Okay. Yes. Okay, we will now go to agenda item three, requ request contractor drain layers license, Greener Group LLC out of Lowell, Mass. Um, usually they're not here, so I'm going to still assume that's the case. Move and approval, subject to conditions. That's a motion by Mr. Dunn. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Mr. Kiro. Uh, any further questions and comments? If not, on a motion by Mr. Dunn, seconded by Mr. Kiro. Attorney Heim, roll call, please. Mr. DeCourcy? Yes. Mr. Hurd? Yes. Mr. Kiro? Yes. Mr. Dunn? Yes. Ms. Mahan? Yes. That's once again a 5 0 vote. Agenda item three is closed. We now will go to agenda item four. Um, I have decided as chair, um, I did this at the very first meeting that we had Zoom, where we discussed uh, town elections and moving forward. Um, normally on individual agenda items, you're either a member of the board or uh, some of the town staff, similar to any corporate um, structure. You know, uh, people sit around the table and if other people come in, you know, they're there to listen. But having said that, and hopefully this doesn't play out <laughs> last time I did this. Um, I do want to, uh, before I turn it over to the manager, if there are individuals who have br brief questions um, or brief comments um, constructively, um, I will uh, take a list and entertain those, but I want to be very cognizant, mindful of the fact that um, if we start to go down a road, and it, it, this is totally my call, um, that um, is really not appropriate and on topic, I am going to um, ask the moderator to unmute that person and uh, one of the moderators and we'll move on in the list. Because uh, one of the things I'm trying to do better at on my job is um, some people have communicated to me in person before March 12th, but afterwards that um, sometimes they find it difficult uh, watching portions of the select board meeting and they can't watch it anymore. And to that, I apologize. Um, we really wanna work on that with everybody else because uh, it really does pain me. I don't want anyone to uh, have those sentiments. So um, with that, um, our town manager, Mr. Chapdelaine, is going to discuss um, local elections, plans, and polling locations. This has been a moving target. If you spoke to me up until this morning, there was one smaller version of polling places that um, I would tell you that was probably the way we were going to go. But then Attorney Heim has had conversations, communications with the Secretary of State's office. Uh, the town manager, who's our liaison to the various town departments, uh, members of our select board office, um, uh, our assistant town manager, Jim Feeney. I'm going to leave people out. This has been such a moving target. And so many town employees have had to do in the middle of this pandemic, uh, basically with no policy procedure or guidelines on how to put a campaign in in the middle of the coronavirus and uh, they've really done a great job. So um, 
with that, I would like to turn it over to our town manager, Mr. Chapterling. Thank you, Madam Chair. So I, I wanna provide the board an update on um, a matter of the mailing of the postcard that we've discussed. I wanna ask the board to consider and approve uh, some slightly modified polling locations for the June 6th election, and then give an update on the work that's still to be done. So uh, the matter of the postcard, which was discussed at last week's board meeting, as well as during a listening session on last Wednesday evening, um, we have cleared up one of the items that was a major question at the listening session, and that was whether or not the request for people to list their date of birth on the return postcard was necessary. We have cleared that up and we will be removing the date of birth line from the postcard. So that should allay the concerns of those who raised those concerns last Wednesday. And we've also in cooperation with the Health and Human Services Department who consulted with uh, Arlington Eats and the Council on Aging in terms of the languages that they recommend we try to put on the postcard, uh, simply saying important, please translate based on the vulnerable populations they work with uh, that speak languages other than English. And those five languages, uh, again, identified by Arlington Eats and the Council on Aging are Mandarin, Spanish, French, Russian, and Portuguese. So we will be putting, uh, again, the translation for important, please translate on this postcard for those five languages. And in consultation with the clerk's office, it's my understanding that we should be able to get this postcard mailed later this week. So by the end of this week, that postcard should go out and residents, uh, registered voters can expect to start seeing that postcard, hopefully by the end of this week, if not early next week. I do wanna point out, it was brought to my attention just before the meeting, uh, there was a campaign mailing that went out uh, that has caused some consternation um, in that it appears to be from the town. And I just wanna make clear that it was not from the town. Uh, it was not this postcard, so you've not missed the postcard. If that's what you're looking for, the postcard will be going out later this week. Um, moving from the postcard, I wanna talk about the polling locations. So we, we're trying to balance uh, having safe, uh, from a public health point of view, polling locations, while also being able to staff those polling locations, given concerns about having, uh, having enough poll workers, but also having uh, too many people in one room if we had fully staffed polls. So we're recommending to the board tonight uh, a reduction down to eight polling locations, primarily using the elementary schools, uh, but also using town hall. And what I'd like to do is just read off what we're proposing in terms of polling locations. And I'll go in, um, they're, they're, they're not in exact order, but starting with one, uh, we have one, three, and five proposed for the Thompson School at 187 Everett Street, two, four, and six at the Hardy School, which is located at 52 Lake Street, seven, eight, and 10 at Town Hall, 730 Massachusetts Avenue, precincts nine and 11, at the Bishop School, located at 25 Columbia Road, precincts 12 and 14, at the Brackett School, located at 66 Eastern Avenue, precincts 13 and 15, at the Stratton School, located at 180 Mountain Avenue, precincts 16, 18, and 20, located at the Dallin School, at, uh, at 185 Florence Ave, and precincts 17, 19 and 21 at the Pierce School located at 85 Park Ave Extension. So statute requires that for any polling location changes, the town send out a postcard, an additional postcard, to the voters who have had their location changed. So for all those changed under this new uh, strategy that we're proposing tonight, a postcard will be sent out, and I believe that's managed by the select board staff uh, in the upcoming weeks. So that will be another, uh, another mailing going out by the town. So again, we uh, firmly know we'll be mailing the postcard. We're ask, uh, asking for board approval of these polling locations tonight. And then in terms of the work we're gonna do going forward, uh, we want to place and locate uh, at least one, possibly more drop boxes for the safe return of ballots uh, for those who are not able to place a stamp and put the ballots to return to the town back in the mail. Uh, we're gonna work on further signage and outreach in different locations in town, calling people's attention 
to the uh, uh, to the election and its date and how to get a ballot. And we're also going to be continually working on how to make sure the polling places can be as safe as possible. Facilities is already ordering plexiglass shields to keep poll workers safe as well as voters safe in their interactions with poll workers, but we'll be doing more work to make sure that we lay out the facilities as appropriate. We'll also be working to identify enough poll workers for the day. Uh, and if we go through the list of existing poll workers and need more, I know I've talked about recruiting existing town employees, and it's also been suggested to me that we could potentially uh, look to college students who are home from school who might also be willing to be trained and work the polls. So we'll be looking at all those options. Uh, with that, I think that's all I wanted to offer tonight, but I'd be happy to answer any questions that the board might have. Okay, and I, I'm going to start with my colleagues on the board. Um, Mr. DeCourcy. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, thank you, Mr. Chapdelaine, for, for that update and, um, and and for the forum last week. I did. Uh, Jim O'Connor had moderated that forum on, on the election, and there were some questions that came out of that that you've uh, addressed tonight, namely on the postcard. So, so thank you for that. And as, as we said all along, we're, we're trying to, to, to get through this and um, put this election to, to, together with the locations and with access to the ballot uh, as best we can. So from what it sounds like, the three precincts that will be receiving postcards are precinct seven, nine, and 20. Is that right? If, if, you, if you voted at Chestnut Manor or at the Park Ave Congregational Church, you'll be voting at a different location this time. That is correct. Okay, all right, so, so that's, um, that's good. And then on the, on the poll workers, just a question, Madam Chair, Mm -hmm. um, to the extent that we need poll workers, do we need to appoint them at our next meeting or uh, appoint them during one of our meetings before the election? Yes. Okay, okay. And then the, the, the last thing I wanna say, and, and this is a follow up on, on the postcard, and I know there's been a lot of discussion around town. There was a lot of discussion at the forum last week and people were concerned about, uh, just various concerns about the postcard and receiving it and sending it back. And, and I just wanna point out, if you're concerned about whether you're going to get the postcard or waiting or, or getting it back, you can still complete the early ballot application or an absentee ballot application and send it back to the clerk's office, either by email or, or by fax. And I think there will be a, a location later, as the manager said. This is the, the, the early ballot application is on the Secretary of State's website. There's a link to it on the clerk's website. It's a one pager, but to the extent there are people out there that are going to be waiting for the postcard and, and they can print out the, the, the ballot and email it back, go right ahead and do it because that will, um, that, that will entitle you to the, to, to the early ballot and, and, you know, perhaps save some time in terms of that, that turnaround later. That's all I have. Thank you, Mr. DeCourcy. And before I call my colleague, um, do we know or can we find out and we can discuss it tomorrow or the next day? I know we have a meeting scheduled, a regular scheduled meeting for May 18th. Um, it sounds like we're going to have to do some outreach uh, in terms of poll workers. Um, and what is the very last day in May? Is it a week before the elections or two weeks? Um, because if that's the case, we may have to, um, we may get 75% at that 18th meeting. And if we get a few more after that, we may have to have a special emergency meeting. So we can discuss that tomorrow, the next day going forward. So um, with that, Mr. Hurd. Thank you. Um, and thank you, town manager and everyone that's been working on this. The, I was viewed the election forum the other day and I think everything, all the issues that were proposed have been addressed. I think the main thing was the, the postcard, which I think is in good shape and getting people making it easy for our citizens to get the uh, postcard back. So thank you for your efforts on that. Um, on the locations, you know, I think this looks good. You know, I think everyone in, had anticipated that Chestnut Manor, an elderly building couldn't house elections and then Park Ave Congregational has a lower voter turnout than other locations. So I, I think this, these locations make sense. Um, just some food for thought for because I know over the years po uh, voting locations has been a hot topic is that I participated in the poll in the election forum the other day and I was one of the five participants out of the 78 people polled 
that said I was going to vote in person. So it looks like we are going to have a, a lot of people who are doing the vote by mail. That's not to say we don't have to be prepared at the locations and make sure that everything every is operating safely and safely for both the voters and the poll workers. And then I just want to reiterate my comment last time. I think one of the main safety features at the polling location is just to try to set it up so there's an entrance and an exit and people go through the location in a line so they're not people exiting aren't passing by the people that are entering. So that's it. Thank you, Mr. Kiro. Thank you, Madam Chair. I think to Mr. Hurd's uh, point, you know, I know that we as a town, we can't really tell people whether to do the, the uh, mail-in vote or in-person voting. Somebody asked me my opinion, though, I'm, I'm going to advise, you know, take advantage of the mail-in voting and because uh, we'd like to keep down numbers at, at the polls. Um, <clears throat> the forum was excellent. I think we had, what, over 100 people who were, who were on um, uh, LinkedIn through Zoom, and I know there would have been more watching. Um, my understanding is that the staffing profile is going to be reduced um, at each of the polls, correct? Madam Chair, uh, Chair. so right now um, we, we've learned that we can have a, mi um, a minimum of one person at a check-in, one at a checkout, so two checkers or two inspectors, and we could have as many as one warden for up to uh, five precincts. Obviously, there's not going to be five precincts at the same location, so we won't have that ratio. Um, I've been talking with a few of the experienced wardens who would like to see one warden per precinct because of the important role that wardens play. And uh, I appreciate that and I, and I think it's a worthy goal. What I've said to them thus far is that we will try to do that, uh, but we wanna make, um, see, see how many wardens are willing to say yes or potentially even clerks might say yes who would be promoted to warden. So we are gonna be going with a reduced profile, the exact scope of that profile we're still working on. Okay. And um, I don't know, Madam Chair, if you know, or, or if, if the manager knows you know, where we're at with the recruitment, how close are we to, um, to uh, having what we need to, to, to staff this number of polling places? Yeah, so I, I am not able to give you a fully informed answer tonight. I've been talking to the select board staff and I know they've, and making the phone calls, the, the general sense they've given me is that there's a pretty significant number of poll workers who are not, not comfortable coming to work. Um, so I, I don't have a count for you from them, but I know they're working on it. And I've told them that I'd like for this week to be the week we really focus on knowing where we stand in that regard. Okay, thank you very much. And Madam Chair, through you just once more, the manager, I just want to acknowledge that this is not really in your job description to be handling the organization of um, of the elections, but this is a, a really extraordinary time, not only because of the pandemic, but we have some other factors that make this an extraordinary time right now. And so I, I just want to publicly thank you for all of the work that you put into it. And I have to admit that when we appointed you as the liaison in this task, it had actually slipped my mind that your first municipal position was actually running an elections operation. So I already knew we had the right guy on it, but, but, uh, <laughs> Uh, I was uh, happy when I remembered that fact as well. So thank you. But I think we can probably all promise that this isn't going to happen every year and every election because uh, um, that this is kind of an extraordinary assignment. So thank you very much. Of course. Thank you. Thank you. And um, before I call Mr. Dunn, as of Friday, when the plan was, when I was contacting with uh, Marie Kapelka in the select board office, we were going to have hoping to have possibly have three uh, voting locations, which meant 47 to 49 employees. We were all set for that. <laughs> so, but obviously now it's gone from three back to eight. So, um, so I know there's been at least 47 to 49 employees identified, but that's about a third of what we need. Um, Mr. Dunn? Uh, at risk of repeating people before me, um, I'm really happy with the plan. I'm really happy with the, the choice of polling locations. I think that the postcard is an excellent innovation to manage the accessibility issues uh, created by uh, the coronavirus. And I also, and I really appreciate the town manager stepping in and handling that innovation. And uh, I guess I'm gathering now that he's also picking up some of the stuff that might traditionally be more 
in the select board's office or the town clerk's office. And um, I really appreciate that he's doing that in this time of need. And uh, I agree that we shouldn't, uh, let's do it because it's gonna, it's the right way to get it done, but let's not make it the precedent uh, for, for the future. But that doesn't mean don't, I'm gonna take it and I'm gonna say thank you because I really appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Dunn. Um, my, uh, besides everything that I've spoken to uh, Mr. Chapdelaine and Attorney Hine over the past couple of weeks, um, uh, something I'd like to put forth um, through the town manager, you, Mr. Chapdelaine, is, and I know there's some framework already in place for this, but um, in terms of um, somebody, it may just be email contact with uh, John Griffin and sort of provide a, you know, premier brief um, discussion of what, we, description of what we discussed here tonight. So he, whatever way, because he's been very good, John Griffin over at the Housing Authority of keeping people out of that building and keeping our senior residents in there safe. Um, it's, it's amazing. Um, I don't want to jinx if I say too many things. So uh, I was thinking uh, I would leave it to our liaison, Mr. Chapdelaine, to reach out to or directs on to Mr. Griffin, to uh, Pam Hallett th with the Housing Corps. And then um, sure this part's already being done uh, in terms of any proper uh, information dissemination through um, Christine Shaw, Council on Aging and all, all, of, all of that. Um, and what I would say is me, you know, five dimes and 10 nickels make a dollar. If there's, you know, any postcards that well, they shouldn't be left over, so that won't happen because they're going to be sent to the registered voters. But just so they can notify, however they notify those populations to um, this information here, because I know a lot of them, you know, they still have the original flip phone and, you know, sometimes don't even use that. And there's nothing wrong with that. Um, so what I will do now, again, I'm breaking. Uh, Ms. I'm sorry, our town manager, Mr. Chapdelaine. Sorry, I just want to very quickly say I, I really appreciate um, the board's expression of thanks, but I do want to make clear, um, um, you know, a total team effort, uh, Doug, town council, um, if, if I've been the coach, he's been the star quarterback, the clerk's office, Jim Feeney, Christine Bongiorno, the select board office, we've been working together a lot. And um, it's really, it's really actually been very gratifying working with all these folks working so hard to make this all happen. So I wanted to make just make that clear that uh, I, I really, I makes me feel good to get the thanks, but I want to spread it around as well. So Thank you. Spread a little love. Okay, um, now uh, if there's anyone who has brief questions or comments, um, I'll give it like 30 seconds and, and then ask for the list and just the same ground rules that we always operate by um, in terms of posing your remarks uh, and or questions. Okay, Mr. Chapteling. So there's, um, so for anybody who wants to Say anything you could use the raise hand feature and right now uh Micaiah Healy has her hand raised. Okay. Um I will call on Micaiah and then I maybe I'll give it one more shot to see if anybody else. Um uh Ms. Healy. Ms. Healy. You should uh you should pop in any second here. I've just promoted her to panelist. Let's see. Hi there. Wow, I can't believe I'm first. Um, I have just what, um, one question about whether there has been conversation about whether hours will be reduced um, for polling and, and I just wanted to see if you could just clarify and make sure that they will be the regular hours because the least disruption to this process, the better. So um, if we can keep that the same, that would be great. Just if you can clarify that for, for all of us. Um, and the other thing that I wanted to say is um, I would just encourage um, that we have more than one drop box, um, secure drop ballot place, um, maybe one in East Arlington in the center um, and the Heights, just for people who get around um, primarily by foot, who don't have vehicles, um, people who are in chronic pain, like the easier um, way to deposit those ballots, the better. That's all. Thank you. Thank you, Micaiah. Uh, Mr. Chapdelaine? 
so I would say, uh, you know, there, there is no intention to change the hours that would be the normal municipal election hours uh, for the polling locations. And we will, uh, we'll, we'll certainly look at uh, multiple drop box. I, I think it's a reasonable request and we'll, we will take a look at it and what, what decisions we make will we'll publicize as widely as possible. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, is there anyone else that's waving or? Uh, so I, town council had his hand raised. I'm not sure if that was intentional or not, but. Attorney Heim. I just wanted to make sure consistent with, um, thank you, Madam Chair. I just wanna make sure consistent with what we'd spoken about before. Uh, we try to figure out some way of, of letting folks who might be dialing in by phone to uh, see if they have anything they wanna offer in terms of public comment. Yes, thank you, Attorney Heim. I forgot to um, include that at the beginning and I should have. Yeah, I, I, I do believe that if someone's on a phone line and they dial star nine, uh, it will show their hand is raised. Okay, uh, first, and I'll check back one last time. Um, I'd like to entertain a motion by one of my colleagues to vote the eight aforementioned polling locations for the June 6th, 2020 election. Is there a motion to move, move approval? So moved. Moved by Mr. Kiro. Is there a second? Second. Second by Mr. Hurd. Um, anyone else? Um, Mr. Chaptelain, that if no, not all. There are no other hands raised at this time. Okay. So, um, barring any questions or comments by my colleagues on a motion by Mr. Kiro, seconded by Mr. Hurd. Attorney Heim, roll call, please. Mr. Nicorsi. Yes. Mr. Hurd. Yes. Mr. Kiro. Yes. Mr. Dunn. Yes. Ms. Mahan. Yes. And that's a unanimous vote. Agenda item four is closed. Um, Mr. Chapdelaine, for agenda item five, was that a time certain that um, Ms. Rate was going to join us? Should I take it now or move on and come back? Ms. Rate and um, Ms. Worko are both with us, uh, so I can promote them to panelists when you're ready. Okay, uh, so we'll go right into agenda item five, CDBG CV CARES Act, funding plan discussion of and vote to support program year 45 plan amendment, uh, along with um, town staff and our three citizens, our three residents who are also on the CDBG committee, uh, myself and Mr. Dunn are also um, members who uh, met for the CARES Act um, CV, as well as two other appropriations of funds. Mr. Dunn, is there anything before I move into the part of the matter? Nope. Okay. And um, I just want to say that um, I want to thank Ms. Ray and Ms. Zorko. Um, again, you know, in the middle of a pandemic crisis, um, you know, pulling together a Zoom meeting with, I don't know how many of us, something team, uh, as well as all the work they had to do beforehand to uh, come up with funding suggestions and, and making sure things were appropriate and fell into categories that um, could be applied to this, as well as really being uh, very flexible with the subcommittee uh, when we had discussion about a few items and sort of tweaking them, you know, revising, adding to. Um, and again, they got that right back to keep this on schedule. So um, I really do appreciate a lot of our town employees. I think they're work, working more than 40 hours a week and definitely more than five days a week. But uh, with that, I'm going to start with you, Mr. Chapdelaine. Uh, that, that was a great introduction. So I, I think I'll turn it right over to Jenny or if Jenny wants Aaron to lead to describe uh, the discussion that was had at the CDBG subcommittee and what's being proposed for the CARES Act funding. Great, thank you, Adam. This is Jenny Reid. I'm the Director of Planning and Community Development for the town. And can you hear me all right? Yes. Excellent. Thank you. Um, there are two matters that are before you in relation to this agenda item. Um, I have provided you with the CDBG subcommittee meeting minutes. The committee met on April 15th um, and uh, essentially the summary of that meeting led to the development of the and the refinement of the substantial amendment that's also before you tonight. Um, I've also provided you with uh, the CARES Act memo that came from HUD directly um, to Ms. Mahan, uh, which notes that we will we anticipate receiving uh, $659,903 uh, 
um, in addition to our regular allocation in community development block grant funds. Uh, the town receives about a million dollars annually as well as some program income that we uh, work to appropriate every single year. This was obviously an expedited process. Really appreciate the time and energy of the, the subcommittee who met uh, to discuss this. Of course, they met previously to review uh, applications earlier this year as well as part of their regular schedule, but this was an additional uh, lift for them, so I appreciated that. Um, as well as the input that we received from a number of uh, people in the community who had comments or questions or new ideas and suggestions for the use of the funding. Um, there are two things that are related to this agenda item that I just want to make sure are clear. The first one is that we provided you with an amendment to the citizen participation plan, which is the very last page of that document. It's page seven to me, uh, but it might be different in different packets, um, which adds language that allows for during an emergency, we will uh, be able to grant any waivers that are provided to us by HUD. Um, in this particular case, there are actually a number of waivers that relate to the execution and implementation of the CARES funding, including being able to spend more money on public services than we usually can. Um, and then also in particular to the citizen participation plan allows for an expedited review process that we will then be able to um, you know, get the money sooner and get it to people in need as soon as possible, which is what um, HUD is looking for us to do uh, because we want to try to move the funding as quickly as possible in relationship to the pandemic, which is the, the sole purpose of the funding. And so with that, that's, that's part one. So we do need to amend the plan. The second part, of course, is what we are actually doing with the funding. And the substantial amendment covers three categories. And um, at, at the end, if you have questions that are more technical in nature, Aaron Zwerko, the assistant director, who's also serving as the interim community development program manager, um, can answer some of those more technical questions should anybody have them. But the three parts of the funding would cover uh, a substantial, a significant amount of funding towards rental assistance. Um, and the first part of the rental assistance program is that we, we designed the program. Initially, we had thought that it would be for $4,000 per household. The subcommittee uh, chose to move that number to $2,000 which would enable us to serve more households. We project it could serve at least 66 households. Um, and it would cover at least $2,000 a month and be covered for th a total number of three months uh, for every single household who qualifies. And these would be low or moderate income households who would have to qualify for the program. It would, be, it would not be administered by the town as in the Department of Planning and Community Development but it could be administered by Housing Corporation for, of Arlington or another agency that regularly provides funds in terms of rental assistance to eligible households. So that's part one. Part two is a, an emergency microenterprise business assistance program. This actually builds off of the program year, the next program year's funding that we had already appropriated and allows for an addition of $200,000 that would be available to a number of businesses um, Again, we're, we're projecting here, but we think that it would at least cover 20 microenterprises. A microenterprise in this case is a, a business that employs five or fewer employees with the, uh, one of them has to be the owner of the business um, and that they have to have the low mod income uh, designation that has to be part of the, the eligible activity for community development block grant funding. So at least uh, $10,000 would be provided, and again, up to 20 microenterprises. The last part of the, um, the planned substantial amendment to allocate these funds would go to public service agencies. Only the difference would be that we would be covering public service agencies who are specifically working on issues related to the pandemic, uh, related to COVID-19. And so what we've suggested here is that it would be anything for housing, uh, basic needs, or not, I'm sorry, basic needs um, other than housing, including other household expenses, food security, mental health counseling, um, child care, transportation, and senior support. Um, we estimate that we could support 400 low to moderate income clients, um, and that's in addition to those, that uh, $1,200, 1200 person number that's already anticipated in this program year. Um, in terms of uh, commentary on this particular 
particular item, we received some feedback about potentially providing support on uh, technology support so that people can more um, easily participate in um, events, have technology access to participate in meetings like this. Um, we understand that the Council on Aging is potentially interested in pursuing such a program. And we would also hope that potentially there will be um, applicants who might serve children, school-aged children, who also could more readily participate in school or town activities um, electronically, but that who do not currently have access to that technology. So, um, so that's an, maybe an addition to that particular program. We also received some feedback on the rental assistance program, which is that potentially we might want to add some discretion to the program that if uh, a household uh, needs more than $2,000 per month, it's at the discretion of the program to potentially fund more per month. Um, and that does align with potentially some um, average rents that are out there, and uh, we might want to consider that as well. So I think in sum, that, um, that outlines the substantial amendment. We are also reprogramming some money, um, which goes will go to rental assistance that's coming from uh, the current FY19 program year. Um, as I mentioned, we're in the middle of the comment period. It actually closes uh, in two days. And um, I'm glad to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Um, just one uh, point of clarification. Um, it's my memory, um, and maybe it's, it's not in the minutes, so maybe I'm not recalling exactly, but I know when we were talking, especially around the 4,000 going to 2,000 allocation, um, and Mr. Dunn can refresh my memory if I'm correct or not, but um, I remember having conversation and I, I seem to remember um, the citizen residents and I believe Mr. Dunn, but I'll let him speak to himself that we didn't um, indicate this would be low to moderate. We just wanted it to be low income um, in terms of the uh, renters relief. But Mr. Dunn, could you, uh, is my memory faulty? As in low only versus low to moderate? Yes, because the point that I made was that um, trying to reach as many people as possible, people who are, are hurting the most, um, if, if it was low to moderate, um, the people who are on the low end are obviously paying lower rents. The people who are on the, in the moderate part um, would automatically use up the 2000. And my rationale was if it was just offered for low income, um, I'm, I'm confident would reach more people because I don't think, you know, if you're low income in terms of your uh, socioeconomic status, um, I doubt um, anybody's over $2,000 and the vast majority are probably not even up to 2000. But um, I, I thought I thought we were in agreement with that, that this, we would offer this just to low income. Yeah. Um, I do remember that line of conversation. I remember being a lot more fixated on the four to two and I don't remember how that one turned out. Okay, because I, I know the citizen residents, that's how I thought it would be put forward. So I guess what I would say to my colleagues and uh, does Mr. Chapdelaine also vote on this? Yes, okay. Um, everything that Ms. Raid has presented, um, I would agree with um, it, but I would just ask one of my colleagues if they feel so inclined um, to, uh, for the uh, up to $2,000 a month program that that's offered to low income um, renters only. So, um, but we'll move forward. Uh, Mr. Chapdelaine? Could I, um, could I suggest an approach that's similar to what Ms. Rate mentioned in terms of the giving the program administrators some flexibility that we start with a priority for those that are just low income, but that if there are not sufficient applicants with those uh, eligibility criteria that they be allowed to expand to those uh, qualifying with moderate income? You know why, I'll say why I don't wanna do that. And again, I'll leave it to my colleagues and the town manager is um, in trying to, if it's low moderate um, versus if it's just low, if it's just low income, um, the, the town uh, planning department, whoever, uh, are going to have to sort of go, it's not going to just be a blast, you know, go on the town website, you've learned about this program, which people who are in moderate and um, higher incomes are used to probably checking once or twice a week. I think 
uh, the way the program in, in an effort to reach uh, more people who really need it. And I don't even think, think we have close to enough in terms of people who fall in the low income category. If, um, if it's just to them, I think it will really guide sort of our outreach and, um, and sort of focus us on the mission of, you know, whether it's working with the food bank, I mean, Arlington Needs Food Bank, Council on Aging, to get the message out to those people who are low income, who may not be, have the technology, they may be savvy enough, but they don't have it. Um, my fear is having it low to moderate, um, it's gonna get scooped up. We're not gonna reach who we want, who's hurting the most right now. Okay. So that's something to ponder. So with that, um, unless uh, Ms. Raid, if there's there anything else I should, you wanted to add, I'm sorry. Just, that, um, just to be clear, just clarify low, moderate income in HUD world, um, low income is 50% of the area median income. So for example, that would be if you're a single person living by yourself, you would not be able to earn, you'd have to earn at or below $41,500 for your household. Um, a two person household is $47,400, three person $53,350. But 50% is categorized as low income, moderate income is 80% area median income. And that is, for example, for a one person household, $62,450, two person, $71,400. So just, just to give you um, some of the benchmarks. So if you uh, wanted to be low income, would you be saying 50% area median income? Is that, just so I have the, um, I, I can put that into the amendment. Yes. Okay. And now to some people, they may say, boy, you know, nobody lives on that amount of money here in Arlington. Uh, yeah, I, to yeah. some, some of those amounts sounded pretty uh, rich <laughs> if you were considered in low income. But anyways, uh, sorry, project kidding me coming out. Um, trying to change the order, Mr. Kiro. Yeah, yeah, just, just just, thank you very much for the presentation. I think it's so important that we get this this um, assistance out right now. Um, we're gonna have a lot of challenges in town once once the cloud lifts um, on this and there are a lot of, the, the, the cloud isn't gonna lift for some time on, on some of the populations we're trying to serve here. I, just looking for some clarification, Madam Chair, on what you're suggesting. This is just for the tenant assistance program that you're, 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 you're uh, talking about? Correct, just yeah, that. Just that, that one. Okay. The okay. renters relief program, whatever you want to call it. Yeah. Just oh, okay. That one. Okay. Great. Th thank you. And um, my question on the small business uh, grant program, 200,000, the, the uh, goal outcome is 20 new mo lower moderate clients. Are you expecting that these are all going to be $10,000 grants or um, are there some criteria that'll be put forward to, to determine the grant amount? I think I, I suppose that goes answer. for everything here. No, yeah. I think I know the answer, but I, the person with the best knowledge would be Ms. Wright. <laughs> I was gonna say, I, I'm happy to answer that question, Mr. Carroll. Um, the, the criteria would be set that it would be up to $10,000 contingent upon a review of the application and the needs, uh, the justification for how the funds will be used. Um, but we would anticipate that if we um, expended $10,000 per business, then obviously it would only serve 20. But I think that it might range and I think we might be able to reach more people potentially. However, there are probably many, many of these smaller entities that are very much in need right now. And so that $10,000 as a grant would be a big source of relief. Okay, great. Thank you very much. And, and my only other question is, do, do we think that, um, I mean, I th I've always been a fan of the homelessness prevention program, HCA, but do we think that, that, that the expenditure of those funds might be slightly delayed because of the, um, the, the current moratorium on evictions? Ms. Wright? I don't have a sense that the money would be delayed. And okay. there are other sources of funding that could potentially go towards emergency assistance, um, okay. which that organization and others might have access to. So um, I don't think that there will be a delay in getting the funding out. Okay, okay, great, thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Hurd? Yeah, so just a question on the small business grant program. Are we re required to limit it to businesses with five or less employees per HUD guidelines? Is that why that's on there? Ms. Wright? Yes, we are. That's the definition of microenterprise. 
Okay. Because it, I mean, I think what comes to mind for Arlington and small businesses in need right now are restaurants, which generally would have more than five employees. So, I mean, it is what it is. If we're limited and we, there's nothing we can do about it, but it's a shame that I think some of those, those are some of the businesses that could benefit most from this. So. Any follow up, Ms. Wright? No, I, I, I understand that comment very well. Okay. And I will just note that business is a broad category, so it could also be um, organizations, nonprofits. Uh, it could be there. There could be a, a range of potential applicants. We'll be putting out those guidelines and the criteria after um, we're finished with the plan amendment and the HUD review okay. of that Thanks. amendment. Mr. DeCourcy. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I did just a couple of questions. I first want to commend Ms. Zorko for the Bruce Springsteen, Clarence Clemens background uh, behind her there. Um, <laughs> I have a question on the tenant assistance program. Um, and you'd mentioned that, that the it will be an outside program administrator. What, what's the mechanism for how, how that would work in terms of how the um, the tenants are, are selected and, and how, the, how the administrator is selected? Ms. Wright? Actually, um, I'll let Erin take that, address that question. She's been working very hard on figuring out the mechanics of the program. If okay. you would, please. Definitely, Ms. Zorko. Hi, thank you. It's uh, my husband's poster, um, <laughs> but yes, I appreciate that. Um, so in the, um, so we would plan on doing a, um, an emergency procurement um, to, uh, find an agency or agencies that would have um, the ability and the experience in um, uh, providing this type of administration. Um, there are a number of those agencies um, that are in the greater Boston area that um, hopefully we can um, draw upon. Um, so as part of that procurement, we would have um, specific uh, requirements of that um, agency that they would have to meet um, in order to be considered for um, to be our administrator of the program. So um, that that would be uh, the means as to which we um, uh, select um, the agency or agencies um, as part of that um, oversight as and part of our program design we would have the guidelines that um, the agency or agencies would have to follow. Um, that would include um, the eligibility requirements, um, the uh, how the money is dispersed. The, these funds do not go to the tenant directly. They actually get paid to the landlord directly. Um, uh, we'd also have requirements on how to um, determine if there's a duplication of benefits, which is a um, concern of HUDs um, at this time um, due to the amount of funding that is out there and available. Um, so we wouldn't, this, the staff in the department would maintain oversight over the program, um, but relying really on the agency or agency to do the day-to-day -day, um, assessment of applicants um, and following the guidelines that we've set forward. Um, I hope that answers the question. No, it does. Thank you. And I, I just want to thank both of you for all the work this year in, on CDBG, because in, I know in addition to the regular grant, we had this reprogramming. I think there may be one more amendment for, for prior year that may be before us shortly. So thank you for all, for all your work on that. Thank you, Mr. DeCourcy. And Mr. Dunn? Thank you, Madam Chair. Through you. Um, Jenny or Aaron, uh, if we go with the low income on the rental and we don't get sufficient applicants to expend the funds, would we get a chance to modify the policy in the future and how would that work? Ms. Wright? I think it would be best to have some flexibility with the policy now rather than have to amend the plan with HUD in the future, um, which would have to go through an amendment process and a review process. Um, so the, the, I think the preference would be that we, um, well, we are able to put out the funding the way that we've already outlined. Um, and if there is funding that's still available, I would suggest that we then perhaps raise the, the cap to 80% 
or perhaps 60% or some other number that might feel more comfortable to the board um, to allow us to be able to continue to utilize the funding. My guess though is that we will actually see a number of people apply and that we won't have any problem um, having people apply for assistance. Yeah, I guess I, I, did, I didn't understand the answer. If we choose to go with low and it isn't full, we, it isn't filled, what, what's the process and the timeline by which we would amend it? We would have to go through the same amendment process that we're going through right now. Repost, re -post, and sorry, Madam Chair, is it? Yeah, yes, Ms. Wright, I'm sorry. Um, <coughs> we would have to go through the same amendment process, uh, which could, could potentially be three, three to four weeks of a review, an amendment to the plan, um, a public review, a submission to HUD, and an approval, and then be able to put the funds back out again. Um, so it would have to go through a plan amendment process because we would be changing the policy and the design of the program. Thank you. Okay. Um, so, but, uh, so to, uh, big picture, um, really, I'm very happy with the, with the work that the, the group has done. I mean, I, I was part of it and I, you know, was happy to participate in it, I think. Um, and I'm actually, I appreciate the assistance from the federal government. I think that this is a uh, money that we're gonna be able to put to work uh, pretty quickly. Uh, on the very specific issue of the criteria for the rental assistance, Madam Chair, um, I understand what your, I understand the preference for low and I can go along with it, but I would, I, I'm really hesitant to write something into the document now that we'd have to go change I would rather write it as a preference and give leave the flexibility um, in with the administrator if necessary. Um, if I could through your question, Mr. Dunn, um, as Ms. Wright, did I just hear um, in your remarks that um, with just a low income designation that um, I don't know if you said you were confident or or some other word that um, um, there wouldn't be any money just left in that fund. I, I, I may have misheard you. Um, no, that you... is what I said. I believe that we will have enough people apply. <clears throat> you could also, however, in uh, recognizing what Mr. Dunn is suggesting, you could also say that there would be priority given to households that are earning at or below 50% of the area median income. And then that would enable us to, in the event that we do not have enough applicants in that pool, be able to go to the next group of uh, uh, households at slightly higher incomes. Um, but I, I do think that we will have enough applicants. Okay. And again, I, I just would say to Mr. Dunn and my colleagues, um, you know, having lived in this world, um, when you see something like this, um, a lot of the times the people who really need to reach get this money, um, when there's a hurdle like low, moderate, um, sometimes things don't, not all the times, but sometimes things really don't work out the way um, I think a program might have been intended. I think if we just keep it just on this, and I know the three citizens agreed with this part, they felt very strongly about this also, um, that um, make the 4,000, Mr. Dunn made the motion to 2,000, and that we uh, keep this open to low income. And if I could ask uh, Ms. Rate, am I, am I correct in what I've been reading in terms of um, future federal stimulus fundings, whether through CARES Act or something else that um, it's anticipated that we may be um, receiving in the short term um, additional monies, whether through another CARES Act or federal stimulus, um, or am I misreading the information that's coming out? Ms. Wright? It's, it's very possible that Arlington will receive additional funding through the CARES Act um, mm -hmm. through this program and potentially through other, in other resources down the line. Right, and we discussed that at the subcommittee meeting and said that um, to the citizens that were there, we kind of gave them a heads up, you know, you may be coming back again sooner rather than later. Uh, the member, the select board members may change, <laughs> but um, the rest of the subcommittee uh, would not. And so to Mr. Dunn's point, I would say that um, if we got to that point in our Ms. Rate's statement that you know she's confident there's more than enough, if this is just low income, it, to me, it's not even enough if we limit it to low income. Plus we have from everything that I'm reading um, coming out of the Hill and 
Ms. Reid and um, Mr. Chaplain and others and Mrs. Warco, um, I anticipate myself, perhaps within the next two, three months, some similar um, funding uh, to to what we're discussing right now. So I would say to that, if if what came out that um, Ms. Ray in the planning department said, well, you know, all the money did go to low income, but boy, did we really have to, you know, go out and find the uh, audience. Um, maybe that's something that could be addressed with the second round of funding, but um, for all the reasons I've stated, I'd like to keep it low income programs that way. It gives everybody a little extra, including myself and members of the board, to um, reach those residents or when they contact us and say, you know, what about me? Uh, so uh, I'll see how my colleagues feel on that. Um, so with that, um, this is a public hearing, right, Jenny? Do I have to have, not have to, but am I supposed to have public comment on this? It's not a public hearing, but okay. it, you are, of course, welcome to have comments received. It, it is a comment period. Um, and so we will, we are continuing to accept comments and writing um, by phone, any other mechanism is acceptable. Okay, let me um, just make sure if any of my colleagues, um, Mr. Hurd, did you have? I was just gonna add to what you said that where the number is, this program will serve about 66 households, correct? Ms. Ray, if, that, if I'm reading that. Yes, 66. I mean, I, and the numbers that we've seen for low income, I'm confident that that will be filled by 66 low income households in the town and I think it's an acceptable risk to make sure that those people get the assistance they need over the next tier of, of residents. Um, and you know, we never we would never want a situation when these funds come in and don't get utilized. But like I said, I, I think that's an acceptable risk to make sure that the funds are going to those who most need them. Thank you, Mr. Hurd. And I just wanna let everyone know the reason I'm trying to put everybody's name and or position when we recognize them is under the executive order. Um, there's language in there to do that for the meeting as well as anybody who um, is coming, uh, listening to this meeting by phone um, and is not uh, using a laptop video computer as well as in terms of um, uh, taking proper minutes. Um, sometimes voices, we pretty much know each other's voices, but every now and then you don't know, <laughs> something could go from there. So um, if I don't say anything else further from my colleagues, the town manager, I, I just, it's not a public hearing, but it is public comment. Is there anyone, um, Mr. Chaplin, if there's anyone out there that wanted to have any brief remarks or questions about the CDBG CARES Act funding? Uh, so I, I did see Mr. Dunn raise his hand, but I also have a, a raised hand uh, from a phone call participant, so I don't know their name, but I can't allow them to speak. Yes, please. Let me know when they're on. But right, they should be able to speak now. Hi, this is Makaya. Sorry, I'm having internet problems, so I'm, I called in with my phone. Um, I My question uh, is, I can't see your faces. Can you hear me? That's okay. Um, no, I'm, just say your full name, just for the record. Sorry. Oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> My name is Makaya Healy. Um, I'm at Howard Street. Um, and uh, my comment is, um, you know, to underscore Diane's point, I, I do think that um, it's important to prioritize our low-income residents, as I think everybody is in agreement on, um, because they're the ones that are hurting the most and don't have the most, um, they don't have a lot of cushion to fall back on. So um, I appreciate that. Um, just the emphasis on needing to make sure that those um, residents get the, the, the most support um, as, as possible. I think a piece of that has to do with how we're communicating um, and to whom we're communicating to. I looked at some census information and it looks like we have um, 7,500 residents that are renters. I don't know how accurate that is. Um, that's from the U.S. Census data. Um, and I know a bunch of renters are probably um, a part of the, you know, the AHA or the Housing Corp. But um, I'm just wondering if um, that could be communicated. It doesn't have to be tonight, obviously, but um, 
just be just communicate how how we're getting the the message out that these grants are available. Um, assuming that it'll go through the town website, but um, just if other thoughts have been given to that, I would love to hear um, what Jenny and Aaron have been working on. And thank you so much for all the work that you're doing on this. I really appreciate it. Thank you. you know, you're welcome. Um, I know it's a public comment and Ms. Raitt is um, the purveyor overseer of public comment. Um, I know you've heard um, Ms. Um, Haley's remarks, Makaya's remarks. Is there anything you wanted to say briefly in response to that or? Yes, absolutely. Thank you, Ms. Mahan. Um, the, the first thing I will just say is that yes, there are approximately 7,500 renters from the last based on uh, more recent data. Um, that figure might be a little bit higher, um, but 45% of those renter households are earning less than 80% of the area median income and 65% are actually spending more than 30% of monthly income on rent. Um, and so, you know, there is, there is a great risk of potential displacement. And so I do think focusing on lower incomes makes uh, a great deal of sense in that regard. Um, in terms of getting the message out, we are working on a fair housing action plan and have been in contact with uh, numerous groups and, and committees um, and the commissions of the town um, that are part of that, that will be part of that process, as well as uh, social service agencies, um, housing providers, et cetera. So we have, Erin really has a long list of, of agencies and entities and even individuals who can help us to spread the message and, and get the word out um, so that people are aware of this opportunity. Um, we also have had feedback about potentially uh, and sending these messages out in uh, various languages. I think we will definitely look into how we can do that or ensure that um, any subrecipient of funds can help to uh, ensure that the message is received in um, any language as appropriate um, so that as many people can hear it. Of course, we will take the usual town channels uh, through social media, town notices, um, the website, um, and our traditional email list. But we do have um, other more specialized lists for other engagement that we are part of. Um, I'm open to other suggestions, of course, in terms of how to make sure as many people are aware of this as possible. Um, and taking you up on that offer, I, I don't know if it's um, allowed. So I um, put it before Ms. Wright. Um, we do have a newly formed chapter and I have been promoting this to people and I'm surprised by how many people in Arlington we're aware of this uh, particular group. Um, there's the Ox chapter of uh, RIM, the Registry of Interfaith Ministries. And we just started a, uh, it's a it's a program. Uh, Sherry Barron is affiliated with it. She gave me a lot of information on it. It's um, the uh, uh, immigrant families uh, here in Arlington. It's called Ox because it's A-R for Arlington, C for Cambridge, big C. S for some of them. I don't know if it's appropriate, um, but um, if the planning department could look at, uh, I don't want to offer something that people can't take advantage of, but these certainly are people that, you know, ref refugees who left their country, some, some in fear of their life. And, you know, they come over here and sometimes I heard stories, they can't work for six months. <laughs> they have to wait. And, um, and we just start this new chapter. So if Ms. Wright, if you could, um, maybe reach out to that group. The person who runs it, I know lives on Egerton Road and I can't think of her name right now. Uh, and I don't think it would be a large number of people here in Arlington, but that's definitely also a needy group. So um, I'll leave that with you, Ms. Wright. Okay, I will follow up. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to, um, unless I hear anything else, um, ask my colleagues to, um, put forth a motion uh, between to the board, select board and town manager for the CDBG CARES Act plan amended um, in the three different allocations previously described. And if anyone has any um, change to the language on the low income versus low moderate, um, I'll leave that to who would like to make the motion. I can see that hand raised, Madam Chair. Who does? I'm sorry. Mr. Dunn. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Dunn. Yeah. Uh, I would like to move approval to the uh, amendment as written in all regards with the exception of adjusting it to the rental program to be 
aimed at low income as opposed to low moderate. Is there a second to Mr. Dunn's motion? Second. Mr. Hurd. Um, just want to check with Ms. Raid and Mr. Chapterlane if we're all set in accordance with this. Ms. Raid? Just one other, the plan, the citizen participation plan amendment needs to be also uh, moved. Okay, hey, uh, do, do you need two separate votes or can we just do it all in one fell swoop? One is right. One of the specific to the plan, that the citizen participation plan is different than the substantial plan amendment. Okay, so two separate ones. All right. Um, any further comment on a motion by Mr. Dunn, seconded by Mr. Hurd? A uh, motion that the select board and town manager need to approve. Attorney Heim, roll call. Mr. Chapdelaine. Yes. Mr. DeCourcy. Yes. Mr. Hurd. Yes. Mr. Curo. Yes. Mr. Dunn. Yes. Ms. Mahan. Yes. Uh, that's a unanimous vote regarding the um, funding recommendation from CDBG as amended by Mr. Dunn regarding the CARES Act. Um, allocation and we now will take a I'll entertain a second motion regarding uh, approval and establishment of the citizen part participation facet uh, is there a motion Madam Mr. Chair, Dunn? move approval of the modification of the emergency and other situation for the citizen participation plan motion by Mr. Dunn is there a second second, second. by Mr. Curo and then I heard Mr. Hurt too but <laughs> I'm trying to move it around a little um is there any question or comments by my colleagues? Um, uh, seeing Ms. Raitt and Mr. Chaplain, it looks like we're set for a vote. So uh, vote by the select board and the town manager. Roll call, please, Attorney Heim. Mr. Chaplain? Yes. Mr. DeCourcy? Yes. Mr. Hurd? Yes. Mr. Curo? Yes. Mr. Dunn? Yes. Ms. Mahan? Yes. That is a 6-0 vote. Agenda item five is closed. We will now go to agenda item six for approval. Creation of an Arlington Economic Development Recovery Task Force. Uh, Mr. Chapdelaine, our town manager. So I'm gonna uh, bid Ms. Zorko adieu and replace her with Ms. Carter from the Planning and uh, Community <laughs> Development Office. So let me just uh, do that. All right, so Ali should be joining uh, here shortly. Um, so this was an idea that was brought forth by Ali and Jenny, and it's modeled, I believe, after something that Mayor Driscoll in Salem uh, has put together in the past week or so. And uh, you know, it, it doesn't—it's not exactly modeled the way we normally ask the board to put together committees. Normally, we would put together a structure, ask you to approve it, and then go recruit candidates. Um, given that time is of the essence, businesses are struggling and are very interested in what a reopening and recovery plan looks like. We've put before you a recommended slate of applicants, um, but are also open to others joining if they uh, expressed interest uh, as well. I don't think this is meant to be an inclusive, not exclusive process. So um, with that, I would ask uh, with the board's indulgence if Jenny or Ali wanted to add anything, but I think this is a good uh, smart thing we can do to try to help our local business community. Um, Ms. Raid? I don't have much more to add from uh, Adam's um, presentation. Just I'm uh, very enthusiastic about the opportunity to both look at the short term and the long term. And I think that the, the focus on recovery is very important and may endure well into the future. Um, so there's some immediate issues, but then of course this will be a long-term um, focus for the town for at least up to another 18 months. And um, there may be, you may be seeing some programs suggestions, policy changes, um, things that will help to assist in that recovery. And I'm hopeful that that's what can come out of these dialogues as well as anything else that will assist businesses in Arlington to be able to operate successfully. Thank you. And if I could, if I could call on Ms. Carter and just ask her to say her full name and her job title, just for the record. Sure, my name is Allison Carter. Uh, I'm the economic development coordinator for the town. You usually hear me as Allie, but full name. <laughs> 
Uh, Allie, the person, I've, I've probably thrown three ideas that I've read about state grants, federal grants, and I'm so excited. And they just came out that morning and I'm um, 0 for 3 because every time I've emailed Adam, he's emails right back. Oh, yes, Allie just finished the application. It's on, she's put in for that grant, whether it's through the attorney general, whether it's through the state website. And But I'm going to keep trying. I'm going to try to find one that you're not already on top of. But I'm 0 for 3 and I don't like to lose. But uh, back <laughs> to you, Ms. Carter. Please do. I love getting suggestions and I don't want to miss anything. Um, I just want to say uh, thank you for entertaining this and having us here tonight. And just that... Um, this is really an opportunity for us to give the business owners a seat at the table. We need to have their input to do this effectively. Um, and so I, um, I've heard so much from so many of them, things that I never would have thought of. Um, so their input is just invaluable. Um, these are things we can't come up with just sitting at our desks or home offices as it were. Um, so thank you so much. Happy to answer any questions with Jenny, if you have any. Okay. Um, and I did hear from only one of my colleagues on the board, who also is a small business owner, I would classify that person as. I can say he because it's all men. <laughs> but um, beyond that, first I'll ask questions. And um, if, um, if I should uh, make an appointment tonight for the select board so they can um, proceed on or... If people want to get back to me, um, we'll see how that goes. But we do have um, Mr. Hurd who has contacted me and indicated he'd be willing to volunteer. And with that, I will start with Mr. Hurd. <laughs> no, let, let uh, me start with Mr. Decor oh, go ahead, Mr. Hurd, go ahead, sorry. No, no comments. I think that other than I think this is an excellent idea and thank you for Allie and the whole staff to, for putting it together. And I know there's a lot of business owners that are struggling right now and a lot of people kicking around ideas and to have a nice think tank for everyone to come together and figure out what we need to do to move past this, I think will be really beneficial for the town. And like I said, I don't wanna throw up my hand and push anyone out, but you know, as a small business owner and someone that's in town, you know, all week, I, I would love to be the board representative on the committee. Thank you, Mr. Hard. Mr. DeCourcy? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, um, and and thank you, Ms. Carter and Ms. Reid, for for the memo and the the reference to Salem too. I did go on their website, and they, that's a, that's an impressive task force that they've created um, out out there. And, and and hopefully, with the the number of people you have here, there there can be ideas generated and and things that um, you know we may not be thinking on the government level, but uh, that can be done within the community in Arlington. So thank you for your efforts. Thank you. Um, Mr. Dunn? Happy to support this great idea. Mr. Kiro? Thank you very much. I, mean, I think you have a great cross section here of uh, Heights Center, East Arlington, as well as a good mix of our business community, our nonprofit sector, uh, our cultural um, sector. So we're, we're all going to have to work together on, on this, um, this recovery. Um, <clears throat> We all know that, that small businesses are suffering and struggling. And I don't know if you can answer this uh, through you, Madam Chair, if, mm -hmm. if Ms. Carter can say, are, are you specifically aware of, of businesses that are on the edge right now um, in the face of the crisis? Ms. Carter? I think we all sense that they oh. are, but. but. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, unfortunately, there's a wide spectrum of responses and states that people are in um, and some people really um, are already reckoning that this that this is the end but it's you know I don't know if since I've spoken to them they've gotten CARES Act support or something else came through um, so it's also their news to share when they're ready to do so um, but it, it really is a, a dire situation for many of our local business owners right now. I appreciate your um, maintaining uh, that list of resources, not just local, but state and federal. I've, I've referred a couple of um, people to you, I know, um, already in the past couple of weeks. So thank you. Your job is more important than ever. It was already pretty darn important. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I think I've, I've probably 
already said all my my remarks. So with that, I will take a motion from one of my colleagues to approve the creation of the Arlington Economic Development Recovery Task Force in that um, uh, we appoint Mr. Hurd as the uh, selectman representative to that committee. Um, and there's some that's a, craft, a little different motion. Is there a motion to that effect? So moved. By Mr. Carroll, is there a second? Second. Second by Mr. DeCourcy. Any further questions and comments? If not, on a motion by Mr. Carroll, seconded by Mr. DeCourcy. Roll call vote, please. Attorney Heim. Mr. DeCourcy. Yes. Mr. Hurd. Yes. Mr. Carroll. Yes. Mr. Dunn. Yes. Ms. Mahan. Yes. And that is a unanimous vote. And thank you once again to Ms. Wright, um, Ms. Cotter, Ms. Rocco, um, who really, I know I've said it a couple times, but um, I can't tell you how many, you know, town employees that are working remotely. Um, and if anyone wants to know what that means, um, they're definitely putting in, it's supposed to be 37 and a half, but um, putting in anywhere from 50 to 60 hours a week. And I'm always so pleased and a little bit angry when I send out an email and off hours on the weekends and you guys respond to me within the hour. <laughs> so um, even though you really technically are on the clock as they say, so appreciate all your efforts. Um, and with that agenda item six is closed. We now will have a warrant article hearing, article 51 revolving funds, attorney Heim. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, this is your uh, typical revolving funds article. Um, I believe the deputy town manager provided a list of the revolving fund balances uh, along with uh, the projected uh, needs and there Mr. Pooler is right on cue. Okay, um, if I could, I think I'm hearing from attorney Heim to now call on our deputy town manager, Mr. Pooler. Sandy, you're muted. Hello, everybody. Nice to see you again. Hello. If you could just say your name just for the record. This is, my name is Sandy Pooler. I'm the deputy town manager. And uh, what you have in front of you is our three documents, a uh, one called Warrant Article Text, which is the text of the Warrant Article. There is a second article, a uh, piece of paper called Mem to SB from Town Council, uh, basically an explanation of what uh, Attorney Heim just said. And then finally, the article language that I provided, which is uh, Article 51 Revolving Funds Doc, uh, which is the uh, language with the amounts for each of the different revolving funds uh, to put forward to town meeting. Um, I will just say in Summary, um, all of these amounts are the same as they have been in previous years in terms of their authorization with two exceptions. One is that we increase the um, authorization for the town hall rentals fund uh, up to $175,000. Uh, that is because um, Christine Bongiorno requested that we do this um, she currently has an existing revolving fund uh, for uh, Woodmore Robins uh, that they use for various events that happen there. Um, but as it turns out that that fund in and of itself does not um, pay all of those costs that they sometimes have used the town hall fund for paying for things that happen um, in mutual areas between the two. And at budget time, she requested and we approved the idea that we would move toward um, basically creating one fund uh, in order to pay for all those activities and that would be the town hall fund. Um, in researching it further as we were preparing this, I think it's become apparent we're going to have to come back in the fall for with a new article to amend the language for that revolving fund uh, to expand the town hall fund to include some of its other purposes. But um, at this point, uh, until we can do that, we would request that you approve uh, the larger amount for the town hall fund. The other one is the fund for um, 
Council on Aging program, which is increased to $100,000. Again, this is at the request of Christine Bongiorno, feeling that um, she thinks once we have um, Council on Aging uh, Senior Center up and running, there could be more programs there, and she wanted the flexibility to be able to run a larger revolving fund. Uh, I can go through any of the other funds that people have questions about, but they are the same as they've been from previous years. The final thing that I would note is I did send to the um, select board office in the files I sent along with these documents, the, uh, the document that Ida Cody prepared that goes at the end of the select board um, report showing what the expenditures in broken down into major areas for all these funds have been for the previous year. So you do have that as part of what you can include in your report to town meeting. And with that, Madam Chair, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Pooler. Mr. Dunn? Uh, I move that we recommend no action on the, uh, on the article. Excuse me. I, wow. I yeah. mean, recommend approval. Oh. All right. I zoned out and I flipped my I flipped it out of my other head. Scared that you know what out of me. I'm like, right. huh? Was, the fact the former finance committee members no, shutting was, down revolving funds. Honest oh. to God, I was in the back of my head. I was thinking about how we'd done no action on everything and how we had a consent agenda. And yeah. uh, just uh, like that was running through the back of my head and the wrong words popped out of my mouth. I second your second motion, but not the first. <laughs> Uh, Mr. Dunn, uh, move approval on Article 51 um, with the uh, uh, amendments to increase Town Hall Rentals Fund to 175,000 and the Council on Aging Program to 100,000. I think that was what Mr. Pooler, yes, put before us. Uh, this is a Warren article hearing. Uh, if there's anyone who uh, from the public who wants to speak on this, uh, wave your hand or use the what is the is it the star nine mr chapter lane star nine feature in your I phone that's the case yes okay and I'll just wait a couple of seconds I, I do see mr curo uh has his hand raised as well okay um so i will turn to mr curo um thank you very much madam chair I, I don't usually dig into this this one too too uh deeply but i i wonder if we uh, if um mr., through you madam chair if mr pooler could um just briefly uh uh summarize there there are a few funds here that have had no activity on them and um I, I just wonder if you could just give a quick rundown on on um on those ones thank you mr pooler um so as mr caro points out there are some funds that have had a lot of activity and some funds that really haven't done anything uh, so just going down, I guess I'll just go quickly through the whole list here. Uh, I can do it fast. Uh, the first one is for private repairs, uh, private way repairs, um, $200,000. We did about, um, we took in money last year, but didn't do any work there. Same thing for public way repairs. So this really has to do with when um, DPW can get around to actually doing, getting this work contracted and they come to, tend to come in spurts. Uh, Fox Community uh, Center Rentals, uh, there was no activity there. Um, and it's, I think it's been the same balance as, as it was from last year. To be honest, I don't know why they, what they're doing over there at the Fox Library. I know there have been a lot of changes in the last uh, couple of years. Uh, that I think has led to this fund not being in use. Uh, Robbins House, we already talked about, Conservation Commission uh, does have activity, so I'm going to skip that. Uh, the Uncle Sam fees, um, that has had no activity. Um, again, last year, I don't think it did either. Um, and uh, I'm sorry, Madam Chair, to, to uh, Mr. Pula, before you go to the others. Yeah. Yes. Uh, on, on this one, I, I, I vaguely remember a painful discussion at, at town meeting about this one year where I think I think this one was discussed for longer than the whole school budget. Um, I don't recall what the revenue source is for this revolving fund. This is for cleaning the statue, right? 
Um, that I don't know off the top of my head. I can go into, uh, let me see, just a minute. That's Mr. Pooler, who's hope, hopefully getting us, if he can, the information. Uh, I've got a list here of the, um, the ordinance. Um, these can be uh, grants and, it just says grants and fees received by the Uncle Sam committee. Okay, that's the, enough. Uh, or yeah. defines it. Yeah, okay, thank you. Mr. Carroll, do you want I think he's indicating he's all set with that. Um, well, with that, with that one, I think there was just one more with oh, okay. no, sorry, with no activity. I'm sorry. Which, all right. Well, so, but, um, I think if I can just skip down. Gibbs to, has no expenditures, and cemetery has nothing. So, oh, the cemetery chapel uh, rentals. Um, just looking at the. These are rental fees associated with the rental of the cemetery chapel. Actually, I'm going to have to ask the town manager if he knows what the situation there is, because I just don't. Mr. Chapdelaine? Yeah, sure. So this was established, I have to say, five, six, maybe even seven years ago, um, actually at the request of a former board member, uh, with, with the hope that we'd be able to get a rental program up and running for those who might use, uh, like to use the cemetery chapel for events, much like the town hall and the Woodmore Robbins house and other venues in town are used for rental. Um, to my to my knowledge, um, there's never really been much success in utilizing it as a rental, and I think that's because there's still somewhat significant renovations uh, that would have to go into the chapel to make it um, an attractive venue. So uh, that that was I, I'm positive of that being the impetus for the creation. Um, whether or not there's a way to breathe life, uh, breathe new life into that idea, we could take a further look at. Thank you, Mr. Kiro. The only thing I would say is that. Um... You know, I, I'm not inclined to move an amendment to the to this right now. But um, you know, we come up on next year. We're at a decade with with no activity. I, I just have to put the question out there about wh whether or not we shouldn't be looking at cleaning up some of these revolving funds and maybe consider mm -hmm. winding them down if they they really don't aren't serving the purpose that we thought that they originally would serve. That's all. No, no. that's Thank a you. good point. Whether it's uh, in September or. Next spring, um, I'll leave it to others to decide, you know, what the time course on that would be. But I, but I agree I, um, on those points. Okay, um, on a motion by Mr. Dunn, seconded by Mr. Curo to move approval on Article 51 and to increase Town Hall Rentals Fund to 170, 175,000, the Council on Aging Program increased to 100,000. Any further questions and comments by my colleagues? Seeing none, Attorney Heim, roll call, please. Mr. DeCourcy? Yes. Mr. Hurd? Yes. Mr. Curo? Yes. Mr. Dunn? Yes. Ms. Mahan? Yes. That's a unanimous vote. Article 51 and warrant article hearings are closed. We now go to agenda item A, correspondence received. We, um, this is uh, comments from Beth Malofchek regarding CD. VG HUD funds. Um, I ask this to um, come in the normal course of business um, when we receive requests and the like um, from residents. So that's why it's on there. Is there a motion to move receipt by? So moved. Mr. Hurd, is there a second by? Second. Is that Mr. Kiro? Sorry, I still can't see the right side of my. It keeps saying, and what is it? Start, set up your calendars. I don't know if you won't let me close it. Um, any further questions and comments? Mo move received by Mr. Hurd, seconded by Mr. Kiro. Attorney Heim, roll call, please. I'm sorry, Madam Chair, may I? Yeah, oh, sure. Yes, Attorney Heim. Is Mr. Dunn still with us? Ooh. <laughs> Ooh, I don't. I can't see the right hand side, but he used to be right in the middle under me, right there, right? He's not there. Madam Chair, if I may? Yes, Attorney Heim? Uh, Ashley, if you're, uh, I believe you're on the call, if you can please note that it looks like Mr. Dunn has changed over to call in. Uh, I see him on the call in listener as an attendee, but okay. he's not on the location. We should note that the time is 9 13. 
So noted at 9.13 p.m., um, Mr. Dunn um, left the meeting, left the video portion of the meeting, and now is he back? At 9.14, uh, he returned. Uh, <laughs> actually, we for a total Faster! Of <laughs> Faster than a speeding, whatever. Okay, so uh, Mr. Don, you're back. You can see and hear us all now. I can, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, on a motion to move receipt by Mr. Hurd. I don't know where I wrote it. Second by secure. Any further questions or comments? If not, Attorney Heim, roll call, please. Mr. DeCourcy. Yes. Mr. Hurd. Yes. Mr. Curo. Yes. Mr. Dunn. Yes. Ms. Mahan. Yes. Okay, we now move to new business. Uh, virtually to my left, Attorney Heim. No new business, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, town Manager, Mr. Chapdelaine. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just very briefly, um, Town's leadership team continues to meet daily and brief on our response to the pandemic. Uh, so we continue to work locally on our response. And as the board knows from the creation of the task force tonight, we're actively talking about what recovery and reopening will look like in the days and weeks to come. Uh, I continue to talk to my colleagues regionally, uh, as well as as a, as a group of local leaders talk to various state officials uh, so that we're having as much of a dialogue as possible about what the state is thinking in terms of reopening and recovery. So we'll continue our plan to send out updates every day. Um, the Board of Health will be meeting Wednesday to consider whether or not it wants to take further measures in regards to face coverings. Um, uh, above and beyond the governor's um, the governor's order, which will go into effect on Wednesday. And again, we'll continue to plan and respond accordingly as the days and weeks go forward. So just wanted to provide that brief update. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chapdelaine. And also um, as myself and my colleagues are aware that um, there was a community conversation um, around uh, face masks, face coverings, face shields, as well as uh, possible exemptions for both children and adults um, in terms of uh, medical um, disabilities, uh, developmentally, developmental disabilities and others. And I had various people, one was Laurie, Lauren Bellin, um, who's an Arlington resident. And uh, um, she had reached out uh, to the town manager and then through the town manager with Christine Bongiorno and thinking that she was going to have to maybe educate and make a case uh, in point for this small group of individuals um, where uh, face covering, maybe a shield is appropriate, but a mask isn't, and in some cases, nothing at all. And she wanted me, as well as everybody on Facebook, that had to be 60, 70 comments um, that were impressed and grateful that our town management and um, town officials are already aware of this small group of individuals and um, certainly take that into account. So I, another, another reason of Arlington because <laughs> we, we know who our residents are. Um, with that, Mr. DeCourcy. Yeah, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, just briefly, I, I just want to, um, we talked about at our last meeting, the, the Arlington COVID-19 relief fund um, started last week. It is now accepting donations and, and uh, Tomorrow is Giving Tuesday, um, and I want to just commend the, the town, the town manager, Christine Bongiorno, the Arlington Health and Human Services Charitable Corporation for, uh, for starting this. And it, it's at uh, www.ahhscc.org. If you go on the town website, you'll see it. That's for donations. But I also know that there will be information going out for people who are going to be in need of these funds. And, and so... Um, as the funds are accumulated, I, I know the word will get out and we want to reach out and, and help our neighbors and, and help people in need. And, and tonight, you heard earlier, we, we voted CDBG funds to help for tenant assistance. This COVID-19 relief fund is, a, is actually a charitable organization to, to help neighbors. And, and maybe down the road locally, there may be an opportunity to even dedicate some CPA funds to, to people in need. So we're, we're all working together through this. If you can help through a donation, great. If you need services or need help, um, that this, this fund is gonna be there. So I, I just wanna point that out and thank every, the individuals who put that together. And thank you, Mr. DeCourcy. You've taken off one of my new business um, 
I'm basically an email contact with a um, little over half a dozen <clears throat> all single mom with children households who are, you know, when I read their stories, I've offered to try to give them money myself directly and then they won't take it. But there's certainly um, a need out there. And um, I know the manager and, and um, Christine Bongiorno, our health and human services uh, director are close to um, wrapping up, you know, an application application process. But the big thing was to get enough money into this account so that um, we didn't set anybody up for false hopes. Um, we want to make sure when we put it out there that we can help. But it, it seems like I've heard a lot of people speak about this fund um, and people who have contacted me individually um, <clears throat> have um, pledged donations. So thank you, Mr. DeCourcy. Any new, and any further new business? Uh, no, Madam Chair. Okay. Who's to my left now? Mr. Dunn? <laughs> uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I actually do have something tonight. It's a fairly serious one, actually. Uh, I sent out an email this weekend um, to the Arlington List and to a few other places about uh, tone and message in the time of Corona. And uh, what I was basic, the and I, I'm, I'm going to resist reading the entire thing here. And uh, it occurs to me I should post it on my blog, blog at dandun.org, and I'll do that uh, after the meeting is over. But the short version is that uh, we've, as select board members and as town of, uh, have received both directly and we also see get CC'd on messages that are sent to town employees that have rhetoric and accusations that's really asymmetric, way over the top with what the actual problem is. And, you know, go, ranges from being compared to the Politburo to, uh, the, to as, uh, um, accusations as terrible as we're trying to exclude people on the basis of race or gender. And uh, I, what I encourage people, what, what I remind people of in my letter is the, the pain and the cost of that. When, we're when uh, you, you know, we have town employees and volunteers who are working really hard to keep the town safe and, and happy and prosperous, that uh, you're also kind of fighting a rear guard action about people who are making some really terrible accusations about you that just have like they have no bearing with reality and no bearing uh, with with the truth. Um, and I and I, I spent a long time thinking about that, and I also thought about uh, realized that I was seeing it also at work in our customer service organization. We for weeks have, have, like we've been having really good business uh, since uh, for for us you know, this, everybody at home for, you know, stay at home company is a, a really a good thing for us, actually. And uh, in the beginning, everyone was really happy and it was all very positive. And then we just noticed a couple of weeks ago that a small segment of people were really unhappy. And it is pretty clear to me that it's uh, the stress and toll of what we're all going through. You know, there's a lot of fear, there's a lot of uncertainty, and there's a lot of stuff that's turned on its head. And I think for a lot of people that um, fear and unknown is coming out in the form of these really ugly messages. And so I encourage people in my letter to um, be more thoughtful about how they write and to observe this in other people. And when you see it, to be the change that you want to see and to maintain that positive attitude. So um, I apologize for the length of my uh, new business. I think I generally take a pass on it. And so hopefully I've saved up a few weeks worth of words that I could use tonight. Thank you, Mr. Dunn. Mr. Caro. I am going to doubly apologize for the length to, to my, my colleagues because um, it's interesting. Um, you know, it's a little discordant because th I think this has been a great meeting. I think we had great discussions as a board. We had great discussions with professional staff. We had very productive um, public comment uh, on the meeting, but but the residents only see like one the lens of, of these meetings and don't necessarily see the whole picture of what's going on. And I've actually I think I think all of us have been a little concerned with with some of what we've seen. Um, and I actually spent a lot of time thinking about it too and and putting my thoughts down in writing. And I'm gonna I'm gonna ask the board for for indulgence for me to to uh, read some of my thoughts on this. Um, so <clears throat> every year town meeting members raise their hands and pledge that they'll treat each other, treat others with mutual respect and will conduct themselves in a civil manner that's becoming an elected town meeting member. It's so disappointing that even as we witness countless acts of kindness in the face of crisis, we've also seen a disturbing erosion of civility in our town's public discourse, often involving 
current town meeting members or individuals who seek to serve in that capacity. It has also become a sport among some to see who can launch the most inflammatory verbal assaults on members of the board and most disturbingly on our hardworking professional staff. Some of this has taken place on camera in response to a value engineering decision of the Arlington High School Building Committee. One town meeting member lodged an ad hominem attack on the town manager describing this project, which is overwhelmingly supported by voters. She referred to it as Chapter Lane's big dig. And I thank my colleague, Mr. Dunn, for calling foul on that behavior at that time. In response to the chair's efforts to maintain a well-ordered meeting, something that every town meeting member should understand and value, we were called dictatorial. Off camera, members of the board have been called undemocratic and authoritarian, in both cases by town meeting members or town meeting candidates. At one of our last meetings before the COVID-19 crisis heated up, we witnessed shouted profanity and verbal attacks against two of our most respected police officers when attendees disagreed with the decision of the board. Raised voices have become more prevalent than at any time since I was elected to the board eight years ago. A few months ago, members of this board took time off their day jobs to engage in racial equity and inclusion training organized by the town manager and his leadership team. This was a direct response to resident suggestions. Attending members of the public were invited to participate fully in this board training. Despite this, at the end of the four hour session, we were shouted at for not doing enough and supposedly shutting out the very people we had welcomed to engage in the day's program and to break bread with us. Now, two incidents over the past week, uh, one of which Mr. Dunn referenced, are particularly offensive. In one case, the board was compared to the Soviet Politburo because images of attendees do not display during virtual meetings, well, they do tonight, but you know, a technical configuration issue with Zoom and the lack of speaker images was compared to the historical disenfranchisement of women and people of color. This is a disgusting distortion and insult to those who suffered and labored to make gains in the face of real struggles for civil rights. Furthermore, as someone who spent a considerable amount of time in the USSR, and devoted two years of his life assisting refugees escaping Soviet oppression, I'm completely outraged by the comparison to that regime. If this board and the town manager were truly devoted to stifling voices of dissent, as some would have us believe, we would not be appointing those same voices to positions of public responsibility on town commissions, something we've done several times over the past months. The second incident, a member of the public and town meeting candidate referred to the process of planning for our municipal election in this challenging time as a sham and accused the town of imposing a poll tax. That despite the fact that this town election will be the most publicized local election with the most public input into its planning and the most options for safe voting in the recent history of Arlington. At our direction, the town manager has been working overtime with the clerk, board staff, town council, acting facilities director, Health and Human Services Department, Envision Arlington, League of Women Voters, Election Modernization Committee, and others to pull off a very complicated logistical feat. More than 100 people participated in last week's public forum on the election and provided very valuable input. Let's be clear. It is very dangerous to plant the seeds of doubt around the legitimacy of a free and fair election. We've seen that movie before and it doesn't end well. So what are the consequences for the current decline in civility? For starters, dedicated volunteers have chosen to step back from town committees. As their public service has been debased, they've taken time back time for family and other personal professional pursuits. Others will follow, and I fear that if this trend continues unabated, we will encounter difficulties recruiting and retaining talented professional staff. All five of us have been duly elected by the voters of Arlington to our system of representative democracy. We're motivated by desire to serve our neighbors and we all take seriously the privilege we are given to make decisions on behalf of those same neighbors. We do so based on our best informed judgment, and not in response to the loudest or most demanding voices. Not everyone will agree with every decision, but everyone is free to voice alternate views and everyone is free to run for office and vote for new representatives if they're unsatisfied with the town's current leadership. Indeed, many are availing themselves of those opportunities. All of that is just fine and as it should be. What is not fine is to express our disagreements through insults, profanity, hyperbole, false equivalencies, or name calling. As people, 
with a declared love for Arlington, I have to think we're all better than this. To be sure, this is not a problem that is unique to Arlington. Our national dialogue is plagued by contentiousness and nastiness. And at this year's Massachusetts Municipal Association annual meeting, panel discussions on the topic of civility through standing room only audiences. I'm asking all people of goodwill to help us hit the reset button and reestablish social norms that restore the balance to our civic polity. Tonight was a really good meeting, so God help us, maybe we're turning the corner. I once again ask Arlington residents to be what our friend Elaine Shea would call upstanders. And I suggest to my colleagues that after the new board is seated in June, it might be worth a more in-depth discussion about any measures we can take to foster a more positive environment that discourages bad behavior. I brought back a number of ideas from the MMA that I'm happy to share, which might form the basis for such a discussion. Lastly, I refer to the tagline that our chair, Ms. Mahan, has used in her frequent email updates to the community during the difficult days of the COVID-19 pandemic. When Arlington faces adversity, we come together and find a way through it. Let's take care of each other. Thank you, and I apologize for the length. Thank you, Mr. Carroll. Um, on that, I'll take a motion to adjourn. Bye. Anybody um, want to adjourn? Moved by Mr. Dunn, seconded by Mr. Hurd. Uh, uh, John didn't get his new business, I don't think. Oh, he didn't do your new business. Oh my gosh, I, how did I skip Mr. over you? I'm sorry. Mr. Hurd, Mr. Hurd, I'm sorry. Well, the preface to my new business was going to be I don't, that's a tough act to follow. <laughs> but um, no, I, I won't go into details, but I, I will say that I did read. Dan's note yesterday and it was very well written and well said and I certainly agree with everything that Joe just said and just to follow up on something that Joe noted on is you know we uh we deal on a daily basis in the past few years with so much misinformation and falsehoods at the federal government level and on both sides and you know surely we can do better at the local level to have real discussions about the issues that are impacting us on a daily basis. And then again, just to thank uh, the town manager, town council, and all of our town department heads and town staff that have been working so hard to both manage the daily business of the town to keep the town running and during this crazy time to keep us safe and to deal with the, you know, the elections that, and uh, keep them accessible to people and they're doing an amazing job. We have nothing but kudos and I know my board members agree with that. So that's it. Thank you. And I apologize, Mr. Hurd. I no just problem. somehow jumped over your seat to the- I almost just let it go. <laughs> oh, no. That's okay. Um, I now will take a motion to adjourn by- Move we adjourn. Mr. Dunn, seconded by- Second. Mr. Hurd, um, on a motion to adjourn. Mr. Dunn, seconded by Mr. Hurd. Roll call vote, please. Uh, and before I do that, the next select board meeting is May 18th, regularly scheduled. Um, roll call vote, please, Attorney Heim, on the motion to adjourn. Mr. DeCourcy? Yes. Mr. Hurd? Yes. Mr. Kiro? Yes. Mr. Dunn? Yes. Ms. Mahan? Yes. We are adjourned. God bless everyone. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night everybody.